Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved case from Washington State. When two teenage girls just suddenly disappeared and were found murdered in the mid-1980s, it was immediately theorised due to the similarities between their cases that they had to have been killed by the same person. Exactly who that person was, the police had no idea and their homicides sadly went cold and remained unsolved for years. But then, literally decades after the crimes, advancements in DNA and forensic science would provide the breakthroughs that the police desperately needed. And and with these breakthroughs came an absolutely shocking realisation, something which no one could have seen coming. Join me as we delve into the horrific killings of Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian. But quickly before we get into the case, I would like to say a massive thank you to AG1 for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. AG1 is a nutritional supplement that I've recently started drinking every single morning. Designed by scientists, it's a comprehensive and convenient blend of over 70 high quality ingredients with vitamins, minerals, whole food source nutrients and more all in a single scoop which can help to support your brain, heart, energy and immune health. Some of you may know or you may have noticed that I've been on a bit of a health and fitness and wellness journey over the last year or so and AG1 has now become a part of that, a part of my everyday routine, my morning routine like I said. Every single morning often before I go out for a run I mix up my AG1 drink and I just feel like it sets me up for the day now. It gives me focus and energy as well as lots of other benefits which makes me feel so much better in myself, not just physically but also mentally. And it's so damn easy and convenient. It literally takes seconds to make your AG1 drink. You just take one scoop, pop it in your glass of water, mix it up and you are good to go. And it tastes really nice as well. I'm not gonna lie, I am a bit fussy when it comes to my food and drink and sometimes I can find certain textures difficult to consume but I can honestly say that I don't have that issue at all with AG1. It just kind of tastes like squash or juice to me, like a really nice sweet refreshing beverage. AG1 is just all about empowering people to take ownership of their health and wellness so if you would like to check them out for yourself and give it a try you can go to drinkag1.com forward slash Molly Westbrook to get started on your order and AG1 are very kindly giving my lovely viewers a free one year supply of AG vitamin D3 and K2 as well as five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Thank you once again to AG1 for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys watching for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders of two teenage girls and it involves heavy themes such as rape and sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back about 38 years now to the spring of 1986 in Tacoma, which is a city located in Washington State in the US. And this is Michelle Welch. She was a young girl who lived in Tacoma with her family. Michelle Evan Welch was born on the 7th of June 1973, making her 12 years old at the time that this case occurred. Her mother was named Barbara Leonard, and I couldn't actually find the name of Michelle's father anywhere, but he and Barbara were separated. To be honest, I'm not totally sure if he was in the picture anymore because Barbara raised Michelle and also her siblings on her own. Michelle had two siblings in total, two sisters. Their names were Angela and Nicole and Michelle was the oldest of the three. And as I said, Barbara raised the kids on her own. So it was just the four of them, Barbara and her three little girls. So of course it was difficult for Barbara, difficult financially to manage on her own, but she worked so hard hard to provide for her girls. She got a good job in a real estate office to pay the bills and buy food and also for a little bit of extra money on the side so that all three girls could learn to play the piano. She paid for them to have piano lessons. Michelle was described as being a very happy and bubbly and trusting young girl and her sister said that she was also incredibly fierce, like almost fearless. She wasn't one to feel easily intimidated by anything. She was just a young girl about to enter 
into her teenage years and she was ready, ready to take on the world. And because she was at that age where she was just about to become a teenager in literally a couple of months time, she was craving a bit more freedom and independence. And one thing that she really, really wanted to do, wanted her mum Barbara to allow her to do, was to take her little sisters to the local park on her own. She wanted to show that she was this responsible big sister and so when spring break in 1986 rolled around she asked her mum Barbara if she could do just that and her mum said yes okay. The date was the 26th of March 1986. It was a Wednesday and a lovely sunny day outside and that morning whilst her mother Barbara was at work Michelle and her sisters decided to head off on their bicycles to Peugeot Park in Tacoma which was just a few miles away from where they lived. They planned to spend a couple of hours there just playing together before their piano lesson later that afternoon. So they left their home at around 10am that morning, they cycled to the park and they just started having fun. And their mother Barbara had agreed that the girls could stay at the park unsupervised I suppose for a short while before their babysitter, a woman named Linda, joined them later on and I think took them to their piano lessons. Now not long after the girls arrived at the park, Michelle actually realised that they'd forgotten something. They'd forgotten their lunch boxes and obviously they would need to eat something before they went to their lesson. And so being the oldest of the three, Michelle told her sisters to wait in the park and she would cycle back home, grab their lunches and cycle back. So at around 11am she got on her bike and headed back home. And in the meantime, whilst Michelle was gone, her sisters Angela and Nicole decided that they needed to use the bathroom. So they headed to, I think, a public restroom nearby. Apparently it took them a little while to return from the restroom because, you know, they were two young girls not really keeping track of time, dawdling a little bit. And so because they took a while, they fully expected that by the time they did return to the park, Michelle would be there waiting with their lunches. However, when they finally did get back, there was no sign of Michelle. But interestingly, Michelle's bicycle was there next to her sister's bikes. And according to some sources, their lunch boxes were also there. They'd been placed on a bench or a picnic table. So that obviously indicated that Michelle had arrived back at the park, but when her sisters returned, they couldn't see her anywhere. Now the three sisters actually had this kind of call out noise between them. If they ever needed to find one another, they would basically call out yoo-hoo and wait for a response. So Angela and Nicole were doing that around the park, waiting to hear Michelle yoo-hoo back, but again, nothing. And despite how young they were at the time, I think Angela and Nicole were only about 11 and nine years old but despite this they just knew instantly that something was wrong something bad must have happened to their big sister. Sources state that after searching the park themselves Angela and Nicole decided to just wait by the main entrance hoping that Michelle would eventually turn up. Unfortunately she didn't but their babysitter Linda did and the girls obviously told Linda about what had happened that they couldn't find Michelle and so Linda called the girl's mother Barbara while she was at work and of course Barbara was instantly very very worried and so she called the police and reported her 12 year old daughter Michelle Welch as missing. Now I did read on one source that initially when Barbara made this report to the police they didn't really take her very seriously at first. Michelle was almost a teenager and so they just assumed that she had perhaps decided to rebel a little bit, go somewhere on her own and not come back straight away but they assumed that eventually she would turn up safe and well. They didn't think that anything bad had happened to her. But Barbara was adamant that no, that was not her daughter. Michelle was not the kind of girl that would have done something like that. She wouldn't have just abandoned her little sisters in the park for that amount of time. So something must have happened to her. And so the police search for Michelle began. And of course, the place that the police focused their search was Peugeot Park, the last place where Michelle was known to be. A number of police officers were enlisted to help search sniffer dogs were brought in. Sources state that volunteers, members of the public, quickly joined in with the search efforts too. Everyone was just desperately hoping that Michelle would be found alive. Maybe she had just gotten into some kind of accident and she was injured somewhere, just waiting for someone to find her. But tragically, as it would turn out, that wouldn't be the case because later that same day, the same day that Michelle disappeared, actually around midnight, one of the search dogs alerted the police to a dead body. It was, of course, the dead body of 12-year-old Michelle Welch.
porch and she had been the victim of a truly brutal murder. Michelle's body was discovered near a makeshift fire pit along one of the walking trails in the park. Her clothing was in disarray. It was clear that her clothes had been torn off of her which indicated a sexual assault and this was ultimately confirmed in her autopsy. She had been horrifically sexually assaulted by her attacker and she was absolutely covered in blood from where she had been both beaten, beaten around the head and also stabbed. It was found that her throat had actually been cut by the killer so this was an incredibly vicious crime. For someone to do that to a 12 year old girl it's the thing of nightmares. Someone who is capable of doing that to a child is more than capable of doing it again and so the police knew that they had to find and apprehend this sadistic killer as fast as they could. So they appealed to the public for information and they received one tip from a 13 year old who actually went to school with Michelle and she told the police that she had seen Michelle and her sisters playing in the park that morning but that wasn't all that she saw. She also noticed this older looking man in the park and he was just watching them from a distance, watching Michelle and her sisters, watching these children. A composite sketch of this man was made and released to the public in the hopes that obviously someone would recognise him and the police did receive several tips and leads off the back of this. There was even one which came from a man. He said that he was jogging through another park in Tacoma called Point Defiance Park which is literally only about three and a half miles away from Peugeot Park and this jogger said that whilst he was in Point Defiance Park he saw a man that looked exactly like the composite sketch. So this terrified the police. They started thinking oh my god is this killer looking for other victims in other parks in Tacoma? Well it seemed as though that probably was the case because just five months after Michelle was murdered another young girl just suddenly disappeared under very similar circumstances. However she vanished in none other than Point Defiance Park. Jennifer Bastian was a 13 year old girl born on the 15th of April 1973 and she also lived in Tacoma with her family. Her mother was named Patty, her father was named Ralph and Jennifer also had a sister, an older sister named Teresa and the Bastians were a very close tight-knit family of four. Jennifer was described by her loved ones as being a very active and energetic young girl. Her mother said that she just had this bundle of energy about her all the time to the point where she genuinely found it difficult to sit still. She just always had to be doing something, something fun. Whether that be horse riding or dancing or gymnastics, cartwheels, she was just always on the go. And one of her favourite activities was cycling. She absolutely loved riding her bicycle. And actually in the summer of 1986 she had started training for this trip, this bike riding tour in the San Juan Islands that she had signed up for and she needed to make sure that she was really fit and ready to go on this tour. So in the summer holidays of 1986 she was going out on her bike every single day practicing to build up her stamina and the 4th of August 1986 was no exception. That morning Jennifer woke up but she and her mum Patty ate some breakfast together, they chatted about what they were getting up to that day. Jennifer told her mum that she was going to go out cycling and later that day at around half two in the afternoon that is exactly what she did. Jennifer left her home, she got on her bike and she cycled to the Point Defiance Park in Tacoma which was not far at all from her house. Now usually Jennifer would go on her bike rides with a friend of hers but on this particular day her friend was unable to and so she just went on her own and she wrote a note for her parents before she left the house which said that she would be home by 6 30 that evening. However by the time 6 30 rolled around there was no sign of Jennifer. She hadn't returned home for her dinner and so of course her parents were immediately concerned. One of the first things that her mum and dad decided to do was call Jennifer's friends. They thought that perhaps after finishing her bike ride she had gone to a friend's house and had just lost track of time but as it would turn out she hadn't. None of her friends had seen or heard from Jennifer and so her parents quickly decided to pick up the phone again but this time to call the police and file a missing persons report. And of course just like in Michelle Welch's case the police focused their search on the place where Jennifer was last known to be, the Point Defiance Park, which is an absolutely huge area by the way. The police had a lot of ground to cover. They brought in sniffer dogs to search the park. The police actually 
asked Jennifer's parents if they could take some of her clothing, which obviously would have had Jennifer's scent on for the sniffer dogs. And they did actually detect her smell in the park, which essentially confirmed that she had been there that day. She had arrived at the park, but unfortunately the dogs were unable to locate her. They found her scent, but not Jennifer herself. Very quickly, the entire Point Defiance Park was closed off for a couple of days whilst the police continued to search. And soon news of Jennifer's disappearance spread like wildfire. It was all over the news, missing posters were created and distributed. And as a result of the media coverage, so many members of the public came forward and offered their help. They volunteered to join the search. So, so many people, including the police, were out looking for Jenny. Jennifer's family made a TV appeal in which they pleaded for anyone with any information about Jennifer's case to come forward. And one person who saw all of this, who had seen Jennifer's case on the news, was Barbara Leonard, the mother of Michelle Welch, the 12-year-old girl who disappeared and was found murdered just five months prior, and whose case still remained unsolved. The police still hadn't found Michelle's killer. And when Barbara saw on the news that another young girl, Jennifer Bastian, was missing, of course her heart just ached for Jennifer's family because she knew all too well what that pain was like, how terrifying it is for your child to go missing. And she just wanted to show her support to the Bastian family. And so a couple of days after Jennifer disappeared, Barbara Leonard actually went to the Bastian's home. She knocked on the front door and she introduced herself to Jennifer's mother, Patty. Barbara told Patty that she had just lost her daughter earlier that same year and that she just wanted Patty to know that even though she was a stranger, she was there for her. She was there for support if she needed it because she could relate. And whilst Patty was, of course, very grateful to Barbara for doing that, she was also kind of confused, I suppose, because obviously Jennifer at this point was still just missing. And Patty always kept that hope that Jennifer would be found alive. She wouldn't allow herself to even consider the possibility that maybe that wouldn't be the case. Her daughter would be found safe and well and she would be brought home. So yeah, even though she really appreciated Barbara's kindness and support, Patty almost refused to believe that they could relate to each other because understandably she refused to accept that there was a chance that her daughter might be dead too. She was adamant that Jennifer would be okay. However, the days ticked by and there was nothing, still no sign of Jennifer. The police were doing everything that they could, following up on tips and leads that they had received from the public, even reported sightings, but there was just no trace of her. But then a couple of weeks after Jennifer's disappearance, towards the end of August 1986, her family received the news that they had been dreading. Her body had been found. A man who was jogging along one of the trails in Point Defiance Park on the 26th of August 1986 told the police that as he was jogging, he just suddenly smelt this overwhelming, absolutely foul smell. And I think knowing that a little girl had vanished from the park just weeks earlier and she still hadn't been found, this jogger thought that he should probably call the police and report this foul smell just in case it possibly could have been related. So the police quickly descended on this particular area in the park to try and determine where this smell was coming from. And it actually took them two whole days, but eventually they discovered the source of the smell. It was, of course, a dead body. Jennifer's body was found lying near a footpath in a thick wooded area, not far from the five mile drive, which was the trail in the Point Defiance Park that Jennifer would have cycled along. She was pretty decomposed by the time she was found. So it was clear that she had lay dead and undiscovered for quite a while, probably since the day that she went missing. And I believe not far from her body, the police also found her bicycle, which had been hidden in undergrowth, as had her body. I think she'd been covered with leaves and branches and stuff, clearly in an attempt to conceal her, which I imagine is why it took a good few weeks for her to be found. It was, of course, established that Jennifer had been the victim of homicide. Her cause of death was strangulation, and she had a ligature around her neck, and she had been sexually assaulted by her killer too. Her body had been posed, and her swimsuit that she was wearing that day was pulled down to her ankles. But boy, did she put up a fight. Sources state that she had self-defense injuries on both her hands and her arms from where she tried desperately hard 
able to fight off her attacker but I mean she was a tiny little thing she was so short and petite so she would have had really no chance to free herself from the evil individual that had committed this crime. Now as you can probably guess as soon as Jennifer's body was found and as soon as it was confirmed that she had been murdered people immediately drew connections between her case and Michelle Welch's case. Instantly people were just like surely these two murders have to be linked. Surely both girls were killed by the same person because their cases were just so incredibly similar. They were two blonde haired blue eyed teenage girls who disappeared and were killed whilst they were riding their bikes in a public park in Tacoma. And as I mentioned earlier Point Defiance Park where Jennifer was killed is just a couple of miles away from Peugeot Park where Michelle was found dead. They'd both been sexually assaulted so it was clear that both murders were sexually motivated. I guess one of the only differences between them was how they were killed. As we know Jennifer was strangled whereas Michelle was beaten and her throat had been cut. But I mean that was it. Apart from that their cases were practically identical so the police felt certain that they were connected. That Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian were killed by the same man. They were looking for one killer responsible for two murders. Now as you can imagine the brutal killings of Michelle and Jennifer left the community in Tacoma filled with absolute dread and fear. Kids were terrified that they could be next. Parents stopped allowing their children to go out alone out of fear that they could be snatched and killed. What once felt like a pretty safe place to live was now the complete opposite because there was a killer probably living amongst them and no one knew who it was. The police continued following up on literally hundreds of tips that they had received from the public. They looked into people of interest and potential suspects but unfortunately it just seemed as though every single tip and lead led nowhere. Just dead end after dead end and soon weeks without answers turned to months, months turned into years and years turned into decades as both cases went cold. The police just could not identify the man who had killed Jennifer and Michelle and so they remained unsolved and the families just had to live with that pain, live with the not knowing, live without justice. About 22 years after the murders, in the fall of 2008, Detective Gene Wilder with the Tacoma Police Department, he began setting up a cold case unit in which he planned to go through all of the unsolved murder cases that had happened in Tacoma in the hopes that now, using the advancements in DNA and forensic technology, he might be able to finally solve some of them. And of course, this included both Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian's case. And someone else who also eventually joined his cold case team was Detective Lindsay Wade. Now Lindsay always kind of felt this personal connection to Michelle and Jennifer's cases I think because although she didn't know the girls personally, she wasn't friends with them, she was around their age at the time of their murders. She was just a couple of years younger and so she shared that fear that other young girls at the time felt, that feeling that they weren't safe, that any one of them could be next. So their stories always resonated with her. She never ever forgot them. As Lindsay grew up she became very interested in the subject of criminology. In high school she read this book about the serial killer Ted Bundy who was also from Tacoma and she was so so fascinated by it. She was fascinated by crimes and murder cases in general and how they are solved and ultimately she decided that that was what she wanted to do with her life. She wanted to help solve these kinds of awful crimes. She wanted to become a police officer and eventually she did. She joined the Tacoma Police Department and she ultimately ended up becoming a detective too. And it was in 2013 when Detective Lindsay Wade joined forces with Detective Jean Miller as part of Tacoma's cold case unit. And of course, as I mentioned, two of the cases that they decided to look back into and reinvestigate were that of Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian. As part of their new investigation, Detective Wade and Miller put together a list of about 2,300 men. A lot of them were offenders, like sex offenders, that I imagine were living in the area or surrounding areas at the time of the killings. But some of them weren't. Some of them were just normal people, I guess. But the reason that they may have been on the list was because they had some kind of involvement in either case. 
okay so okay for an example perhaps they had submitted a tip to the police in the original investigations back in the 80s perhaps they were a witness to something there were a variety of different men on this list that detective wade and miller took an interest in for some reason or another it was their hope that perhaps they could use forensic science to possibly link one of these 2300 men to the murders now speaking of forensics something that i haven't actually mentioned yet is that when Michelle's body was recovered back in March of 1986, scientists did actually detect traces of the killer's semen from her body, obviously from where she'd been sexually assaulted. Of course they couldn't do much with this evidence at the time because DNA was in its infancy, but years later, I believe it was around 2006, scientists were able to develop a DNA profile of the killer from this semen and it was entered onto the CODIS database. But unfortunately no match was found so that was a bit of a setback but you know at least they had the killer's DNA. Now sadly the same couldn't be said for Jennifer's case. Back when she was found murdered in August of 1986 they didn't find any traces of semen on samples from her body. However something that had been kept in storage all these years was Jennifer's swimsuit. The swimsuit that she was wearing on the day that she died and so when Michelle and Jennifer's case was reopened by the cold case unit, her swimsuit was sent off to the crime lab for testing and thankfully scientists did detect traces of semen in the crotch area and a DNA profile of the killer was developed from this and with this discovery of the semen on this swimsuit came an absolutely shocking realisation in the case. So as we know right from day one everyone believed including the police that Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian were killed by the same man because of how similar their murders seemed to be. Everyone was just convinced that it had to be the same guy that had murdered them. However, to the detectives' absolute shock, when the DNA of Michelle's killer was compared to this new DNA profile developed of Jennifer's killer, it was found that they were not a match. The girls did not have the same murderer after all, which, as I said, was just a complete and utter shock it was like a bombshell to the detectives. They had always worked on these cases with the theory that they were looking for the same killer, but they won. It was a different guy all along. So all this time, there were two child killers on the loose in Tacoma, not just one. It was just baffling, truly baffling, but alas, those were the results, no match. And so the investigations continued, and now, I suppose, kind of for the first time, these were considered two separate investigations. Following the discovery of the semen on Jennifer's swimsuit, the DNA of her killer was also entered into CODIS, but sadly, once again, just like in Michelle's case, there was no match on the system. Towards the end of 2014, Detective Jean Miller actually retired, which meant that the cases were left in the very capable hands of Detective Lindsay Wade, and surprisingly, someone who actually kind of joined Detective Wade's team around this this time was Patty Bastian, Jennifer's mother. Obviously it had been years and years since her daughter's murder and Patty was at that age where she was starting to retire from her career and tragically her husband Ralph Bastian, Jennifer's father, he passed away in 2015. He died having never found out who killed his daughter and following this and following her retirement Patty decided that she wanted to just see if she could help Detective Wade in any way at all with her investigations into Jennifer and Michelle's murders. She obviously knew that she wouldn't be allowed to see any of the case files, even her own daughters, but just, just anything that she could do to help the cold case unit make their jobs a little easier. I think even if it was just making them a tea or a coffee, she wanted to do it. She wanted to volunteer her time to helping them solve the cases. And apparently Patty and Detective Wade actually became very close as a result of this. They really hit it off, which is just lovely. Now, one line of inquiry that Detective Wade decided to pursue was the collection of voluntary DNA samples from several men that were considered potential suspects in the cases. So if you recall, she and Detective Miller had previously compiled a list of about 2,300 men from both case files. However, of course, to get voluntary DNA samples from all of these men would be near enough impossible, or at least it would take years
years and years and years probably. So Detective Wade went through this list and she kind of dwindled it down as much as she could to about 160 men, I think. 160 men that she considered high priority to test. And this was mainly because most of these men in particular had a previous history of committing crimes of a sexual or violent nature. She wanted to take a sample of DNA from every single one of these men, at least the ones that were still alive at this point, and gradually, batch by batch, send them off for testing to see if any of them were a match to the DNA of either Michelle's killer or Jennifer's killer. Of course, naturally, this was a process that would take a long time to complete, having to go out and track down each of these men and ask for their DNA and then send it off for testing. And so, in the meantime, another line of inquiry that Detective Wade decided to pursue also was the use of forensic genealogy. And the cold case team started working with genetic genealogist Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick. They were hopeful that with Colleen's help and with the use of forensic genealogy, they might be able to use the killer's DNA profiles to locate potential relatives of both perpetrators on genealogy databases. And whilst nothing much really came of this in regards to Michelle's case, Dr. Fitzpatrick did have a potential development in Jennifer's case to feed back to Detective Wade. Dr. Fitzpatrick was able to tell Wade that Jennifer's killer may have potentially had one of three last names, surnames. Those names were Holbrook, Smith and Washburn. So Detective Wade immediately dove back into the case files looking for men that had one of these last names. And she didn't really find anyone significant with the last name Smith or Holbrook, but there was someone with the surname Washburn. His name was Robert Washburn, and oddly enough, although it was determined that Jennifer's killer may have had the last name Washburn, Robert Washburn was actually a name that was in Michelle Welch's case file, not Jennifer's. But he wasn't in her case file because he was ever considered a suspect in her murder. He was in her case file because he seemed to be a potential witness. Do you remember earlier on I showed you this composite sketch of the man that was seen watching Michelle and her sisters in the Peugeot Park on the day that she was killed and how a jogger later came forward to the police saying that he believed he had seen a man who looked identical to this sketch in the Point Defiance Park in Tacoma where Jennifer was later murdered. Well it turns out that this Robert Washburn was the guy who called in this tip. He was the jogger who reported this. He reported it about two months after Michelle died, hence why his name was in Michelle's case file because of this witness statement that he gave. Like I said, he was never considered a suspect in either murders at the time, but now, years and years later, his last name has been identified as possibly being the last name of Jennifer Bastian's killer. So that was very interesting and Detective Wade made a note of Robert Washburn's name and she added him to the long list of men that she wanted her team to collect a DNA sample from. And when they eventually got to Robert, by all accounts, he willingly gave over his DNA. He was happy to give it to the police and it was added to the big batch of other samples that had been collected to eventually be sent off for testing. Meanwhile, Detective Wade also started working with Parabon as part of her investigation. Now Parabon are a company that we've spoken about a couple of times before on this channel. They basically use a technique called DNA phenotyping which is a process where scientists take a DNA profile and using it they are able to predict what the owner of that DNA profile looks like based on their DNA sequence and genetic information. It can tell you things such as a person's possible eye colour, hair colour, skin tone, their origin. It's pretty incredible. Incredible. And with Parabon's help in 2016, these composite images were created and released of what Michelle's killer may have looked like at the time of her murder and what Jennifer's killer may have looked like too. And as a result of this, several tips did come in from the public of who the perpetrators may have been, but ultimately they just kind of led to dead ends. As all of this was going on, the samples from those 160 men were still being collected and they were being sent off to the crime lab for testing 
coming in batches. They would be sent off in batches of about 20 samples at a time. And this, again, wasn't a quick process. Each batch would take probably a few months to get through. And when the first batch was sent off, there was no match. When the second batch was sent off, once again, no match. And it just seemed to be continuing that way every single time. Every batch that was sent off wasn't yielding any results. There were no matches. And then in the spring of 2018, Detective Lindsay Wade made the very difficult decision to retire from the Tacoma Police Department as she had secured a new job that she really wanted to pursue working for the Attorney General's office. And as I said, this was very tough for her, as you can imagine. By this point, she had worked on both Michelle and Jennifer's cold cases for years, desperately trying to find their killers. So it was so hard for her to make that decision to walk away from them when they were still unsolved. But just before she left that job, she decided to send the final batch of about 18 DNA samples off for testing. And as they were in the crime lab, she left the cold case unit, she started her new job, and she, let's be honest, probably expected nothing to really come of that last batch either. It would just be a batch of no matches once again. But thankfully, that wasn't the case. And in May of 2018, there was an absolutely huge breakthrough. Lindsay Wade received a call from the new detective that was given her old job in the Tacoma cold case unit and he was calling to inform Lindsay that after more than 31 years they finally had an answer as to who killed 13 year old Jennifer Bastian because one of those 18 samples in that last batch that she had sent off for testing had come back as an exact match to the DNA of her murderer and that match was to none other than Robert Washburn the guy who had submitted that tip in Michelle Welch's case months before Jennifer's death. It was Robert's semen that was found on Jennifer's swimsuit. So just for a bit of extra information about him, Robert Washburn was around 60 years old by the time this DNA match was made in May of 2018, which means that at the time of Jennifer's murder in August of 1986, he would have been around his late 20s. I believe he grew up in Tacoma. He he went to school there, he worked as an engineer, however later on in his life, obviously after Jennifer's death, he moved to the state of Illinois. Surprisingly, he didn't have any kind of criminal record, he'd never really been involved with the law before. He was a father, he had a daughter who was actually disabled and he cared for her by May of 2018, he was her carer, and he was just seen as this nice, quiet, normal, hardworking man. But now, over three decades, after Jennifer's murder, his DNA has identified him as being the sadistic individual responsible for her death. And so he was quickly arrested. He was arrested on the 11th of May 2018 and charged with the rape and murder of 13-year-old Jennifer Bastian. And Jennifer's family were informed that finally, after so long, so many years of waiting, her killer had finally been found. Robert Washburn was said to be very very nervous after his arrest. He would literally sweat so much just from where he was so anxious. I mean, it's understandable. After all this time, he thought he'd gotten away with it. So of course he was going to be very, very on edge when he was finally apprehended. Although initially he completely denied it. He claimed that it was a mistake. The DNA match was a mistake. He was not the killer. And so when it came to his court proceedings, he pleaded not guilty, meaning that this case was headed to trial. And would you believe it, just the month following his arrest in June of 2018, there was a huge development in Michelle Welch's case too. So as it turns out, none of the DNA samples collected from those 160 men matched the DNA of Michelle Welch's killer. And so because that was a dead end, the cold case team turned once again to the company Parabon for their help. Parabon were able to upload her killer's DNA onto Jedmatch, a public genetic genealogy database and with new DNA methods that they now had at their disposal they were able to narrow down the search for Michelle's killer 
to two brothers. They now believed that one of these brothers was her murderer. So in an attempt to obtain a DNA sample, the police secretly followed one of the brothers and one day they followed him to a restaurant where they saw him use a napkin. So obviously because this napkin would have had his DNA on, after he left the restaurant they retrieved it and it was sent to the crime lab for testing and it was found that the DNA from this napkin, the DNA from this brother, was an exact match to the DNA of the man who murdered 12 year old Michelle Welch. The perpetrator was a man named Gary Charles Hartman. He was I believe around 66 years old by this time in mid 2018, meaning that at the time of the crime in March of 1986 he would have been around 34 years old. At the time of Michelle's murder he resided in North Tacoma and quite unbelievably once again just like Robert Washburn he didn't have any kind of criminal record. Gary Hartman actually worked as a psychiatric nurse of all things and he was also described as being a very nice caring person. He was a family man which is just crazy. I think it's so mad that you know these two men Gary Hartman and Robert Washburn were thought of by everyone that knew them as just being nice normal guys. No one would have had any indication that either of them would have been capable of committing such heinous crimes against children because there was nothing in their background or personalities that we know of which would have suggested this. But of course DNA evidence does not lie and so on the 20th of June 2018, more than 32 years after the crime, Gary Hartman was arrested and charged with the rape and murder of Michelle Welch to which he pleaded not guilty. But before we talk any more about his court proceedings, let's firstly discuss Robert Washburn. So we know that initially he also pleaded not guilty to the charges of rape and murder in Jennifer's case and his trial was set to take place in 2019. However, just a couple of months after his arrest, Robert Washburn suddenly decided to change his plea to guilty. He finally admitted that he did in fact kill Jennifer by strangling her to death. Although something that he didn't admit to or just kind of refused to talk about in this written statement, written confession that he gave was the sexual assault aspect of the crime. We obviously know that Jennifer was sexually assaulted because of the semen that was found on her bathing suit but he just refused to talk about that. When it came to his sentencing he received 27 years in prison for what he had done meaning that he could be let out when he is in his late 80s but of course that's if he even makes it to that age. Now it's not known why Robert Washburn called in that tip in regards to Michelle's case before he killed Jennifer. Perhaps he just wanted to somehow insert himself into a murder investigation before he went on to commit a murder himself. Who honestly knows? But as for Gary Hartman following his not guilty plea, his trial took place only a couple of years ago in March of 2022. And according to reports, during his trial, his defence team didn't actually deny that Gary Hartman was the one who killed Michelle Wow. However, they claimed that he could not be held responsible for his actions due to the fact that he was experiencing a psychotic break at the time of the murder. Apparently Hartman had a very traumatic childhood. His parents were very, very abusive towards him and this led to him developing addictions to both drugs and alcohol and so for that reason, because of his mental health, like I said, his defence team said that he couldn't be held accountable for the killing of Michelle Welch and they said that he probably had no memory of committing the murder in the aftermath due to psychosis but clearly the jury were not buying that because at the end of his trial he was convicted. He was found guilty of the rape and murder of Michelle Welch and he was sentenced to 26 and a half years in prison. I don't actually know why he received less time than Robert Washburn. Obviously Robert Washburn received 27 years and Gary Hartman received 26 and a half which seems really odd to me given the fact that Robert Washburn pleaded guilty and Gary Hartman didn't. But anyway, after more than three and a half decades, finally both girls, both Jennifer Bastian and Michelle Welch had received justice for their horrific murders. In May of 2019, a new bill named after the girls called Jennifer and Michelle's Law was passed in Washington State, which expands DNA collection and basically 
basically authorises law enforcement to take a DNA sample from both adults or juveniles who have been convicted of a felony or convicted of indecent exposure and it ensures that the data gets submitted into a national registry right away for DNA identification analysis purposes. And that concludes this case, the heartbreaking stories of Michelle Welch and Jennifer Bastian. You know, initially when I first started my research, it was my intention just to cover Jennifer's case, but I quickly decided to cover both in just one video because even though they were obviously killed by two different men, their cases are still linked together because of course for a long time everyone thought that they were murdered by the same man, but even though they weren't, their stories will forever be intertwined because of Jennifer and Michelle's law, which is an incredible lasting legacy that they share. But yeah, that is it for this video. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case down below in the comments and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. They can be unsolved cases, solved cases, serial killer cases, you name it. Again, you can let me know in the comments or alternatively, I do have a case request form linked in the description box too. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye.